Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, I'm excited for what we've got. Uh, if you're here tonight, uh, well, obviously you're here tonight. If you were here last week, I should say, you say, Pastor Luke, I may not be here. Well, get here, even though you're sitting here. Uh, we're going to resume a, a little series that I, I started last week, a two-part series. We'll conclude it tonight, uh, talking about Limitless. Last week, if you recall, if you were, were not here, let's just go over that. Last week, we talked about a, a really interesting concept, and, and we looked at uh, some of the verses out of the Word of God that, that tell us that God is an over and above God, that God's desire for you and I is really to have an over and above life. But there are things that we can do in our own lives that will limit God and His effectiveness or His blessing and power in our life. So last week, we talked about the subject of limitless life and what you and I could do to limit God as a way of learning what we should not do so that we could live a limitless life. And today I want to take the, turn the coin to the other side and now I want to look at living life to its full potential because God has got a plan for each and every one of us. If you were here this morning, Pastor Jim had such a great message that you really should get a hold of that, talking about uh, some things about why we are the way we are. But he said some things and it was one of those things that I don't even know if it was really even part of it, but I just caught on to it from the Spirit, of the, uh, from the Holy Spirit. And he was just talking about that, you know, our desire, our purpose here on life is we're not just here because two people got together and we were the byproduct of that, that one night or whatever it might be. We are here because God has a purpose, which means that we're not like a Forrest Gump. You remember that, remember that movie, the little, the little Feather? Remember that floating around and, or, or like a, life, a box of chocolate? It's not like that. God's desire for us is to not ever know what we're going to get or to just kind of drift and, and just kind of meander through life and at the end, well, we've made it. You see, God has each and every one of us in this place, right here, right now, where you live, where you are right now, He has brought you here for a purpose. You were called for a time such as this. And I believe with all of my heart that when we see that God has a purpose for our life, when we understand that we aren't just here because of, of, of two people or because of families getting together or because my parents did this or whatever. We're not here just because of that, but we are here because we are called by God, chosen for right now, for this time. Then I believe that there are some things that we can do to live our lives to its full potential. And I, the beautiful thing about life's potential, as we discussed and as we saw last week, is that God is that over and above God, that He is exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So when we see the potential that life has for us, we realize that God goes one step, two step, three step further in our lives than what we could have ever imagined. I used an example of a lady that was uh, at one point in time a, 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 a staff member of our church. Her name was Sarita. And I used the example of her uh, driving for the very first time a brand new car. Well, it just so happens, I believe it was on Monday or Tuesday. Sarita, if you're watching, we love you. On uh, Monday or Tuesday, I got an email from her and she was saying, just past like, I just couldn't believe that you even remembered that. I just, I, I never in my life would have thought that I would have been driving a new car, let alone in, in I think it was like 2009 or something like that. In 2009, a 2010 uh, Ford Mustang. I mean, she just, it was just the car of her dreams. And you see, that's exactly God's desire for us is to be over and above what we could ask or think. So today I want to look at what we can do to live to our full potential and what it's going to take to live life to its full potential. Before we get into that, I want to take just a quick moment and show you a couple of verses so that you and I could understand and be on the same page as to what is our potential in life? What does God's Word say? Because remember, I told you earlier in our prayer, we don't come to hear from man. So it's not about what I have to tell you what your life's potential is about because you might say, well, you come from this and I come from that and your potential and my potential are two, two different things. Let's, let's get Reader's Digest suggestions out of the way. Let's look at what the, the Word of God says and His plan for our lives and what God sees as, way of, as means of potential for each and every one of our lives. We are all in this together in this uh, walk of life. So in, in John the 10th chapter, John the 10th chapter, verse number 10. I'll just go through these kind of quickly. But if you've got your Bibles, you can open there or you can mark them or you can circle. These are really good things for you and I to know and to read and to understand. John the 10th chapter, verse number 10. Jesus gives us this illustration and he says, The thief does not come to except to steal, kill, and to destroy. The thief meaning the devil, the dark one or the evil one as we talked about this morning. If you, if you feel like right now your life is being full of theft, of, theft, of robbery, of destruction, then you need to go 
online, grab the messages from the past couple of weeks about spiritual warfare. Pastor Deborah taught on spiritual warfare last week. Two weeks ago on Sunday, I taught about spiritual warfare. You need to get that because I tell you what, it's right where we're at. And Jesus says, this is the game plan of the enemy is to steal, to kill and destroy. But look at what God's plan for our lives is. Jesus says, but I have come that they, look to your neighbor and say they. they. Look to your other neighbor and say that's me. They, that means you and I. We, I have come that they may have it more abundantly. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus says, I have come not just that you may have life, not that you may just live, but that you may have abundant life. Abundant life being over and above, beyond your expectations. God's plan, His expectations, His potential for your life is to have abundant life. Does anybody know what abundant life is? Abundance. That means over and above, more than you need in life. God says, that's my plan for you. I, I, you're there in John, the 10th chapter. I'm going to take you now to 2 Corinthians, the 9th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 9th chapter, verse number 8. For a while there, we, we were, we are, we've been making this profession of our faith, and this is the scripture of that profession. And, and Paul the Apostle is telling the church, you and I, and he says, and God is able to do what? To make all grace abound towards you. Let's break that down for just a moment. What is God's grace? God's grace is his divine ability to get the job done right on our behalf when we can't do it. Paul talks about the thorn in his flesh saying that there was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him and when he asked God for it to be removed, God says, no, but my grace is in your life. Paul then responded that I will boast, I will be glad, I will rejoice in my infirmities because now I know that in my weakness, God's power is made perfect. So now it says that all grace may abound towards you, meaning God's power in our life, perfecting that which is weak in our lives. You and I all have weaknesses in our lives. Can anybody say amen? I'll say amen to that one. I got weaknesses. Some of you are like, no, no, shh, I don't got any. I'm pastor, I'm perfect. Well, we'll pray for you afterwards because maybe a little bit of weakness of pride there, but you know, that's a different night. So. But here he says that all grace may abound to you. I love the example. Do you know what abound means? That means to rush at, at a rapid pace. I, we used to have this St. Bernard. I, you know, does anybody know what St. Bernard is? It's the huge behemoth of a dog. All right, I mean, the, he, Bogey probably weighed close to 200 pounds. I mean, he was a monster dog. He was, you know, a, a, an adult man was at least at his hips. I mean, he was just a huge dog. And Bogey, when he would run would just have this momentum, and he would just carry that weight. And I remember one time, uh, he was running around the yard, and he, and he was inside the patio, and we lived in Yukaipa up at the time, and you know, we lived up near a chicken ranch, and if you know anything about Yukaipa and chicken ranches, Yukaipa plus chicken ranches equals flies. And so we had this patio that was all screened in as, as a way to try to keep the flies out of the house. And I remember dad was just screening the, the patio in and, and Bogey somehow got in and he was chasing Bogey and Bogey just had this momentum. Just, he couldn't stop. It was this cement floor and Bogey tried to get out because he was, you know, Pastor Jim's a big guy. Bogey's a big dog, big guy, big, big this isn't gonna go well. Well, the door was closed, so Bogey, in his abounding momentum, found the most logical way out, and that was through the screen that Pastor Jim had just laid out across the patio, just jumped right through it. You see, abounding is, that screen was not going to stop the momentum of that 200-pound dog. If had it been a chihuahua, Okay, that chihuahua would have probably been stopped dead in that metallic screen material. But Bogey went right through it. Why? Because he was abounding in momentum. It wasn't going to stop based on opposition. Now, here he's saying that all grace may abound. It's not going to stop as it's coming towards you. You can't slow the train down because God's grace is made perfect in your weakness. So all grace may abound towards you that you may always have all sufficiency in all things. Now see, we, we, we always attribute this to finances because the, the, the content of this is financial. But what does all things mean? What does all things mean? All right, you're kind of getting there. All things means all things. Everything. So this doesn't just mean money. 
This means joy, like we were talking about. This means a a life, a, a quality of life. This means happiness. This means fulfillment. This means God's plan in your life. All things that you may have, all sufficiency and all things, but that's not where God stops. Okay, good. God says, I want to give you everything you need. But what does he say? That you may have an, uh, what's that word again? Abundance more than above for every good work. So we've seen now that God's plan is for you to have life and to have life more abundant. Now we've seen that God's grace is abounding. It's charging. It's coming at you. That you might have more than you need. Moving on. We were here last week, Ephesians, the third chapter, verse number 20, talking about Paul as he's exhorting the church. He says, and my God, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Are you catching the drift? There's this recurring word, abundant, meaning more than above. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. What is all? What does all include, encompass? Everything. Once again, you see, this isn't just finances. This isn't just uh, happiness. This isn't just fulfillment. This isn't just your children or your job or whatever it might be, your ministry. This is everything in your life. He says, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to the power of God that works in us. It's God's power that works in us. And that's where we talked about limiting that power in our lives. But I want to show you another verse. We had made this profession every once in a while too. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse number 19. He says, and my God shall supply what? All your need. According to whose riches and glory? Yours? My God shall supply all your need according to your bank account. My God shall supply all your need according to the world's economy. My God shall supply all your need according to the circumstances and what's available at hand. No, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Which means it doesn't run out. God doesn't have an empty meter on His tanks. Why? Because they never decrease. We saw that with the women, uh, the, the widow and the oil. It doesn't run out until we run out. So we have this potential in life that we've got to understand. We've got to see. We've got to open our eyes to see not life how we see it, not life through our perspective, not life through what we think we can do. Well, you know, I'm only smart enough to get, I I never graduated high school or I didn't do well in college or I've always been in this position and I've always been overlooked at the raise or whatever it might be. So this just must be my calling. We have got to look beyond our own circumstances where we are right now and begin to not see life just as how how we see it, but begin to see our lives how God sees it. Because God is exceedingly abundantly. God goes beyond what we could ask or think. He shall supply all our needs according to His riches and glory. God is the one who provides for you and I. And God is the one who sees tremendous potential in our lives and has a plan. For each and every one of us. You may not even realize that. You may just have wandered in here. Sometimes we hear from people all the time, man, I don't even know how I got here, but here I am tonight. If anything tonight, understand that God has a plan for you. And his plan for you takes your expectations and goes beyond those because God is a God that exceeds our expectations. So today, let's look at some things that you and I can do What it's going to take to live life to our full potential. Living life to your full potential. I'm going to give you five words with little statements afterwards. Now, sometimes I can get a little cheesy. And today is one of those days because the five words all rhyme. Just I thought maybe you might remember it if they rhymed. You know, sometimes... Pat, Pat, preachers are really clever. They can even make those little, you know, acronyms and they can spell. I, I tried. I was going through the thesaurus like, man, maybe, no. But rhyming, okay, I can rhyme. All right, so today let's look at, can we look, can you, will you go with me? Can, you, can we do this today? Can we talk about living life to our full potential today? Can we talk about some of these things today? All right, what it's going to take. Just think of it like that. What is it going to take to live life to its full potential, to our full potential? Number one. First thing tonight, what we're thinking about tonight, or we're talking about, is prayer. I have it like this. Prayer, and then a little dash, changes things. 
It's going to take prayer in our lives to live to the full potential of what God has for us. You see, prayer is the very device in which we communicate with God. And then if we are not in constant communication with God, if we are not talking to God, if we are not letting our requests be made known to God, then what we are doing is we are holding on to a two-way conversation and we are blocking communication back and forth. And God's desire is to have communication with us. Did you know, I talk about this all the time, we are the only creatures on the earth that have been given the intellect that we have. They say, you know, I've heard people say that if dolphins had opposable thumbs, that they could, they could communicate or they could build cities and all these other things. And, and I've even said it like this. Uh, one time I was preaching a message and I said, you know, we marvel that parrots can mimic what human beings say. Has anybody ever tried to bark like a dog? Anybody ever barked like a dog? Anybody ever mimicked a dog? Anybody ever mimicked a parrot? Anybody ever made dolphin noises? Or How about this when you had kids? What does a cow say? Moo, right? Have you ever thought that we can mimic everything else that we hear, but we marvel that a parrot can one, utter one or two words after being trained? You see, God gave us the gift of language that nothing else has in this world. Nobody else communicates on the language that human beings communicate on. You know, it's not about the jungle law or the jungle book or anything like, oh, well, well, they communicate based on looks and so do we. Anybody who's married, you know you communicate based on looks. Am I there? <laughs> Husbands looking, they, oh, wives, they know, they see that look from across the room and know what's coming. We have, are the only creatures on earth that have been given the ability to communicate the way we do. Why? Because God said, let us make them in our image. God said, I don't care about talking to dolphins. I'll talk to dolphins if I want to. I don't care about talking to whales. I'm sorry for those of you that are real into the earth thing. Okay, that's great. God loves the whales. He made them. But God says, I want them to be in my image. Why? Because I want to talk to them. I want to have communication with them. I want them to, to be connected to me. And in order for us to live our life to full potential, to God's potential, we have got to live a life of prayer. Why? Because prayer changes Things. Listen, if you don't, if, if you don't think so, you got to get on the, on the wagon train, guys, because prayer changes things. I used a testimony just two weeks ago. I lost my dogs. Anybody remember that? I asked everybody to pray for me. One of the things that I was praying, because I don't know how they came back, but they came back. Everybody's asking, how did they came? I don't know. All right, they, they, they were just, they were in my neighbor's yard. He stole them. I, I put a warrant out for his arrest. He was on vacation. He goes here. I text him, says, my dogs are in your, your yard. And he calls me, what are you talking about? So what? Didn't have any, but the thing is, see, I believed that when we gathered together as a church, we were praying and we had all sorts of prayers going out there. Lord, may they return. Lord, if somebody's got them, let them bring them back. I don't know. I didn't see. All I know is they weren't there in that spot the day before, but the day after they were there. Why? Because prayer changes things. And we have got to live a life of fervent prayer. Colossians, you know, I'll just, I'll just put this one on the overhead for you. Colossians in the, in the fourth chapter, Paul's exhorting the church and he says, continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Man, I remember one time we were in our young adult service and we had pre-service prayer. And, and there was this one, this one young gentleman and he, he was new to the faith and we were all praying and then he kind of just, he kind of wanted to pray. So he just kind of jumped in and he was like, well, Lord, thanks for today. Thanks for all the blessings, even though I, I don't know what they are and I haven't seen them. I know that you've got blessings for me. Lord, thank you for your plan in my life. I'm not sure what it is, but thank you for it. And I just stopped him and said, hey, 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 whoop, 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 whoop. You, you, you can't be like that. God's not after your Eeyore. Oh, nobody see, knows the trouble I've seen. Lord, I don't know what to say, but I'm going to pray because you said so. God's not after that. God says, I want you to be earnest in your prayer. I want you to pray like you mean it. I want you to be fervent. That's why the Bible says it, that the fervent, effective prayers of the righteous man avail as much. They, they are answered. Why? Because God is waiting for heartfelt communication with him. And that's why Paul exhorts us to be earnest in our prayer, to be vigilant in it, to continually pray over and over and over again. It's not just a, well, you know, yeah, I prayed yesterday. Okay, that was yesterday. How about that? I mean, if you're a husband and wife and you only talk to each other one day a week, that's not a good relationship. 
I love this. Paul the Apostle in, in 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter, verse number 17, just says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Pray without, Pastor Luke, I've always wanted to know what pray without ceasing means. I mean, how do, I can't talk to anybody else if I pray without ceasing because then I'm only talking to God. I, I loved it. When I, was, when I lived in Oklahoma, the, the, the president of our Bible college, who had been through decades of ministry, effective evangelist ministry all over the world, just, I mean, a, a pastor to the pastors had taught us. And he was teaching on this, and everybody was sitting on the edge of their seat because everybody, what does he have to say about what is pray without ceasing? He had the most simple illustration. He says, you know, when you talk to somebody on the phone, now we don't ever do this anymore, we just text. But go back with me back in the day before wireless came out. Remember when you had a phone and it was connected to the wall? Some of you are like, what are you talking about? I still have a phone connected to the wall. <laughs> Remember when you talk on the phone and the conversation would kind of be over and you say, okay, what would you say? Bye, right? Click. The, the phone hung up. And you, you with me? You're like, gosh, look, I don't remember last time I talked. Yes, okay, all right, good. See, it's a lot like that. Prayer is a lot like that. Oftentimes we go before God and we say, God, these are my requests. God, these are my needs. God, you're so great. God, you're so wonderful. Bye. Click. And, and, and the, the line has been severed. The, the communication is no longer there. And when we pray without ceasing, what we simply are to be doing is to be keeping our hearts open to hear and to receive from God. Because let me tell you something. Prayer is not always about the words we say. Oftentimes prayer, some of the most effective prayer, the things that we don't say, the times that we just sit and we listen. Why? Because prayer is a two-way road, but we always see prayer as a one-way road. God, here's my needs. <laughs> I got them out. They're yours. But God says, hey, wait. You know, I've got this three-year-old. He's at this, he's at this, uh, the, 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 really, he wants attention. He craves attention. So if anybody, if the attention's not on him, in an instant, he's there pulling on my pants. Daddy, daddy, daddy. So I'm having a conversation with somebody. And you know, if any of you have, have been parents, you know this stage. And he's just, daddy, daddy, daddy. I want to tell you something. Dad, 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 I got a question. Dad, dad. It's like, hold on. Daddy's talking to the adults. Dad, 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 I want to talk to you. Not right now. Why? Because I'm so busy talking to somebody else that I don't have time for him. But you see, on the flip side, oftentimes we're that way with God. We're so busy talking to somebody else or we're so busy wrapped up in our own things that we don't have time to hear what God has to say to us. And God, God is exhorting us to be vigilant in our prayer, to be effective, to be fervent in our prayers, to not only just to be effective, fervent prayers aren't always loud prayers. Okay, let, let's just clear the air on that. It doesn't mean you've got to scream at God to pray. But what that does mean is that prayer also involves listening. It also involves hearing. Because God wants to speak to you. And we talked about clarity. We talked about direction today. If we want clarity and direction, we've got to make time in our lives, in our prayers, to continually do this each and every day, all day. It doesn't have to be long hours and hours and hours of prayer, but it's so wonderful just to go to God and say, God, here I am. I just want to spend some time with you and just allow God to minister. And I promise God fulfills and he never fails our expectations. We're talking about living beyond or above our potential. Talking about that prayer was the first thing. Number two, because they rhyme. Number two, share your testimony. Share your testimony. Last week, one of the things that we talked about in limiting God was silence and not speaking out on the things that we believe. I gave you the example, if you recall, of D.L. Moody being invited to a, a, the opening celebration of a bar. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to preach here if you're inviting me. And finally, they said, well, you can He says, well, I won't come if you let me pray. He eventually was able to pray with those two bar owners, and one of them got saved. But if we remain silent to the things that God has called us to speak out on or to speak about, then we're limiting God. But it's the same way as the effectiveness of our life is that we have got to share our testimony. We have got to share what God has done for us with others. Because I love how the Bible tells us that as iron sharpens iron, so a friend is, sharpens a friend. So that one man sharpens the countenance of another. In Revelation, the 12th chapter, talking about John's revelation uh, of, of Christ as the dragon. He's talking about this great battle. Revelation, the 12th chapter, talking about you and I, the saints. He says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and what? By the word of their testimony. Yeah. Oftentimes in church, we don't share our testimony enough with each other. We don't share what God has done in our lives, but sometimes we have got to let the world know what God, our great and mighty God, has done in our lives. If anything, for us to know what God's done in our life. What does that mean? 
which means oftentimes we've got to share with others what God has done in our lives to remind us what God has done in our lives. Yeah. Think of it like that. Sometimes we need to speak what has happened so that we remember what has happened. Has anybody ever been, anybody ever been reminiscing? And as you're talking and you're just kind of, you're just kind of going in the conversation after a while, you kind of go, Man, I forgot that ever happened. But because you were talking about it, because you were telling the story, because you were sharing it, that memory came back in. You see, God's desire for us is not only have communication with him, but communication with others as well. To share what God has done in our lives. I love in, in Acts, the, the fourth and the fifth chapter, the apostles, Peter and James and John, they're out on the streets of, uh, of Jerusalem and all about. And they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are they doing? They're simply sharing what God has done in their lives. What Jesus Christ has taught them. And they say, listen, we don't know anything but what God has shown us. We don't know anything but what we have seen from the Holy Spirit. And we've got, to, we've got to share it. And they were locked up. They were persecuted. They were brought before the high courts. They were threatened. And eventually they were just asked, please don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they're responsible. Well, who should we obey? Should we obey God or, or, or man? And going on in that, a couple of verses down, they say, and listen, we are his witnesses. We saw these things. And, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. We can only say what we have been witnesses to. And they shared their testimony. They shared what Jesus Christ had shared with them, what the Holy Spirit had revealed to them. And thousands were added to the church because of that. You know, what, you know one of the most effective ways of witnessing is to share your story. It's not, it's not to say, listen, let me tell you about what happened to this one guy I know. And God is so good that maybe that guy, what happened to that guy could happen to you. But when you say, listen, let me tell you about what God has done in my life. Because we can connect to people on a personal level. When that story is once removed or twice removed, let me tell you about a guy who knows a guy. All of a sudden, that connection level is not there. But when we on a one-on-one -on -one basis are talking to somebody, man, God is so good. He did this in my life. People, we, we've all been there. We've all seen somebody who's been successful. Maybe somebody who got some money or somebody who had a successful job. Somebody who's telling a story about something that happened. We all say, I've been there. I said, man, I want that to happen to me. Anybody been there before? No? Okay. Well, I've been there. So... It's the same principle. When we share how God has done something in our lives, people say, man, you know what? I want that to happen to me. When, you, when you're, ta you're talking about this peace, you know, everybody's at what's going on in your life. Your life seems like it's a wreck. Everything's falling apart. But why are you, how are you not? Well, let me tell you, God is good. I need that in my life. The most effective way of evangelism is personal testimony. To share it with those around us. To share your testimony. You say, Pastor Luke, God hasn't done anything for me yet. It's time to start talking. God saved you. You're here today. If he hasn't yet, well, we'll take care of that in a moment. But you've got a testimony. The more you share it, the more you know it. One of the things, just a little practical, practical application. Oftentimes we don't know our story. And one of the things that they told us to do in our Bible college when we were there in Oklahoma is they said, go write it down. Write it down. Get your testimony into 60 seconds. Sometimes people don't want to hear your five-hour story. Oh, let me tell you about what God, and after a while, they're like, dude, all right, enough. I get it. 60 seconds. Go write your story down. Write what God has done down in your life. Get it down. Put it on a flashcard. Say, man, what, what's going on? Well, psh, 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 let me tell you about what God has done in my If you have to, do it. You've got the little note app on your phone, write it down there. 60 seconds, be able to share your story with somebody. And I'll tell you what, that's the most effective way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oftentimes you might be the only scripture or the only witness somebody ever sees in their life. And it's your testimony that is effective. We're talking about living life to the full potential, living life to the full potential. Because they rhyme, we talked about prayer. We talked about share. Today, number three, let's care for others. Care for others. You see, God has called us as his people to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. About a month ago, we were celebrating our 26th anniversary and we looked back at some of the scriptures that, that we, are, we as a church were founded on. And, and in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, you, you came and you, you fed me when I was hungry. You visited me while I was in prison. You took care of me while I was sick. When I was naked, you clothed me. And he says, the righteous responded and said, God, when did we see you and, 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 and feed you? When did we visit you when you were in prison? When did we clothe you when you were naked? I don't, I don't, God, when did we do this? And he says, when you did this to the least of my brethren, you did this to me. Because you see, God's desire, God loves people. Therefore, we as God's people need to love people. I love what Phil Pringle said when he was here a couple of months ago. He says, nobody hates like Christians. 
can I get on a soapbox for a moment? It's true. Oftentimes, I don't know if it's a thing about pride, if it's, well, my denomination's better than your denomination, or, or I know what, what the Holy Spirit's call is in your life, and, 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 or I know, whatever it might be. And we begin to, to battle against each other. And we get these walls of offense built up in our lives, and we become secluded. But God says, listen, I don't want you to do that. I want you to care for people. I want you to care for one another, to be compassionate to those who are, who are going through something. To, 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 to hold on to them. To love people. First Peter, the third chapter. First Peter, the third chapter, verse number eight. Peter says to you and I, he says, finally, all of you be one mind. Having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. You know, I've got a couple of friends in my life. That, you know, I call them brother. Not just because that's Christianese, you know, we, we as Christians, we always like, to, well, they're my brother and they're my sister, but because in my life we have been connected, we have gone through the thick and the thin, and, and I consider them to be my brothers. And I text them, because like, manly men text, each, text themselves, I love you, man. But you see, we love like that, that deep relationship, that love that we only share with family. Here he says, as Christians to, to one another, that we've got to love each other. We've got to put our heart out there. Yeah, it may get hurt. Yeah, people may stomp on it. People may take it for granted. But the Bible tells us that we love because God loved us first. And if God can survive the trampling of humanity on his love, then you and I can endure the trampling of those around us when we give it. But the, the thing we've got to do is we've got to learn to give and to be compassionate. To love his brothers, to be tender-hearted, to be courteous. James talks about true religion, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted, to visit those and to care for those who can't care for themselves. God's desire is for the lost and he says, I want you to care for others like I care for others. God cared for you and I so much so that we're here today. And God says, I want you to care for others so that they find the goodness of God. We've got to learn to care for others. You know, one of the best ways to care for somebody is to be genuine with them. Man, I'll tell you what, there's nothing like fake or automated responses. Has anybody ever experienced that? I remember, I, since I'm like on reminisce mode about Bible college, there was this one lady that I sat next to for an entire semester in Bible college. And, and at, towards the end of the semester, I just I stopped asking her how she was doing every day. You know, you see somebody, hey, how's it going? Because it was like an answering machine. Beep. Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Thank you. Beep. Leave a message. How are you doing today? Beep. Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Thank you. Beep. How are you doing today? Beep. Blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Thank you. Beep. Not a hey, I'm doing good. How are you? She never once asked me how I was. But yet she was so into the blab it and grab it and name it and proclaim it. I'm blessed and I'm highly favored. But you see what happened is in that she got so wrapped up in claiming it that she lost the genuineness of her life and she was a turn off to those around her. We can get so wrapped up in religion and Christianity. Well, oh, look at me on my Christianity. Oh, the Bible, thus saith the Lord. And I said, God, duh. we can get so wrapped up and what the culture of Christianity is that we lose who we are. You see, God made each and every one of us the way we are. Some of us are funny. Some of us are really not funny. All right, some of us are, are brilliant. Some of us have a hard time with things. Okay, it's okay. God made you for a specific, you say, Pastor, look, I got the short end of the stick. All right, I know. God still has a plan. But you see, when you are genuine, when somebody knows that you're not coming at them with a fake, with a facade, wearing a mask of Christianity, but you are who you are, then that's when the walls of offense are broken down. And that's when we can really begin to care for somebody. When somebody's going through something and they can see on your eyes, on your heart, and your actions, and your words that you genuinely care for them, well, when you say, I'll pray for you, that you really will pray for them, then they know, man, somebody's out there to care for me. And that is exactly what we need around this country and around this world, is people to pray and to care for each other. Are you with me today? Yeah. Off the soapbox. Here we go. Talking about limitless and, and living to, to our full potential. Since they rhyme, we've talked about prayer, share, care. All right, number, what is this, number four? Dare. Just, no, yeah, Dare. To step, did that, did I, just, I just did the wrong one. Number four, that's, I just let you, oh man, I blew it. <laughs> Number four, erase that, all right, forget that. Number four, where? 
God's goodness. Where? God's goodness. What, what, what does that mean? It means that God, his goodness, his Holy Spirit, his presence in our life is like a robe, like a jacket that we are to wear, to display. I was talking in our young adult service on Friday, a, a story about a young man. Joseph, his dad, Jacob, made him a, a brilliant coat. We, we've called it like this, the, the coat of many colors. You see, it was, it was this vibrant coat that his brothers, when they saw him from afar off walking, they knew who he was. Why? Because he was wearing this coat. And that's much like the presence of God in our lives. You see, when we come and we know who Jesus is and we accept the gift of salvation and now we are living and we are living life for God's potentials, it's like we are draping the Holy Spirit over our lives and we are wearing the very presence of God and we are now on display for the world to see. As we walk down the street, people should be able to see that it's not just us walking down the street, but it's God and the presence of God going with us wherever we go to wear God's good goodness. We've got to learn to wear. And in, in John, the 15th chapter, Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, Jesus, as he's talking to his disciples, he said, this is talk about, talk about abundant life. Talk about God's potentials. John, the 15th chapter, verse number eight, verse number seven, he says, if you ask anything in my name, you'll receive it. Verse number eight, he says, by this, my father is glorified. What? That you bear much fruit. So you see God blessing you in your life, that abundance that we talked about, that life and life more abundant, that exceeding or, or it's over and above what we can ask or think, that potential that God has, that fruit, that abundance in our life, that brings blessing to God by doing so. So as God blesses us, we in turn are blessed and people around us see that God is faithful, that God is real, that God is true. He's not a myth. He's not dead, but God exists in our life. And now we become walking billboards for the glory and the goodness of God. And like we talked about with sharing, people say, man, whatever you got, I want. Whatever you have, I want, I need. How do I get some of that? Has anybody ever been around somebody who's just always happy and you think, man, I want that. Or how about this? Is there any, you don't have to, you don't have to raise your hands, but I know you're in here. Is there any, any pessimist or the glass is half empty, right? You don't raise your hand. You're all right. Yeah, sometimes you look at the people that are optimists. The glass is half full. You think, man, I really want to be like that. I really want to look at the glass and say, well, it's half full. Well, what we got to start doing is getting God into our life and wearing that. And as we do, God begins to, this change as we discussed this, this morning of, of who, why we are the way we are and allowing God's word to be our leader and the, the motivation and the empowering of the Holy Spirit through the word of God to, to affect us and to change us. And as we begin to shed who we once were and become who God is, we are draping the Holy Spirit and the presence of God about us that the world might see. Jesus tells us that we're the salt of the earth. A light of the, uh, the light of the world, that, uh, that we're like a city on a hill, like the rim of the world up there on the mountains, that at the nighttime you see the light shining. And he says, uh, ver uh, Matthew, the fifth chapter, he says, your light, let your light shine before men. Why? So they may see your good works and glorify you. Oh, wait, wait. Hello. So they may see your good works and glorify you. So they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our lives, our purpose here is to bring glory to God in everything that we do. In everything that we do to glorify God as walking billboards. We are walking billboards for, for Christ. One more, you already know what it is because I blew it. I let the cat out of the bag. Number five, dare to step out in faith. Dare to step out in faith. We talked about one of the things that we can do to, to, to stifle the presence of God, to, to stop God's ability in our life, and that's doubt. As we read in James, he says, if anybody doubts, they're not going to get anything. Let, he says, let, that man not, let not that man suppose he receives anything from God. And here I say, it's not about making a plan B. This is about taking that leap of faith. Does anybody remember that movie, Indiana Jones? Remember that when he, you say, man, Pastor, you're talking about movies a lot today. Remember that where he's standing at the edge of that cliff? Remember, and he's holding on his heart and he sticks his leg out there and he's like, oh, there's the bottomless pit. Remember, and the, remember the pit was painted like, you know, the, the, the walkway. Anyways, it's a leap of faith to step out. There is no safety net. There is no, there is nothing to catch you because God says, I want you in your life to not just not worry about plan B, but I want you to go forward. 
I want you to step out. I want you to have faith. And I want you to have faith every day for the impossible. Faith for the things that, that, that doesn't seem like it's, like it's not going to exist. We believe in what God has for us and what God's word says about me. That's what I will have faith for. So that abundant life, man, I'm not feeling it. Faith, I dare you to step out. You remember, you remember, okay, since we're in the movie mood. Remember that movie, The Christmas Story? It's on like every year for 24 hours. Remember that the little kids at the, at, the, at the pole in the wintertime? Remember that? And he's like, he's like, lick the pole. No, lick the pole. I dare you. No, I double dare you. No, I double dog dare you. Ooh. You couldn't walk away from that. You would be branded as a coward. And he has this whole monologue of how much that dog dare was. Let me say it like this as a pastor. I dare you, challenge you to step out in faith and to trust God in your life and to see what God does. To get out from the safety zone, to get out from the comfort zone, to get out from what you think you can do and to see what God has for you. I was talking to a young guy on Friday night and we were just talking about him and what he did. And he asked me, he says, man, how, how did you get into pastoring? And I told him, Mrs. Man, I, I did videos. I was a video producer. I says, they just kept asking me here at the church, you need, to, you need to do our young adult service. You need to get into pastoring. I kept saying, no, I don't want to do it. No, no, no. You need to pastor. No, leave me alone. I'm happy where I'm at. To the point where I said, man, I just, God was removing the, the, the fulfillment of what I was doing because God had something else and, and I had to step out in faith. And finally they came, my brother-in-law, Dan, and my dad, Pastor Jim said, you need to come and take the young adults ministry. Finally was like, okay, I'll do it. Why? Because I'm going to step out in faith and I'm going to trust that God has me. And everybody there, he said, man, well, you're really good at doing it. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. I, I don't want to do it, but God has me here. And because I'm trusting in God, God gives me the ability to do what I'm doing. And God gives you the ability to do what he has called you to do. We've got to dare to step out in faith. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, very, very familiar verse. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse number six, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Talk about stifling God's presence and his power in our lives. How about living a life with no faith? God says, I'm not pleased with you. If God is not pleased with us, why would he bless us? He says, I want you to live in faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Why? Because he who goes to God or comes to God must believe that he is who he is what? He is God moving forward, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Doesn't that reward sound a lot like abundant life? Exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ask or think according to all his riches and glory. So first off, you've got to believe that God is God. Secondly, you've got to believe that God has a plan for you. And then to step out, to get beyond your comfort zone. To go beyond that, I love a couple chapters down or verses down, eighth verse. It says that by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go and the, to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. God didn't tell Abraham the destination. God came to Abraham and he said, get out of the land of your fathers to a place I will show you. So Abraham didn't pull out his iPhone, pull up Google Maps because he can't trust Apple Maps and say, God, give me the GPS location. He didn't have that. He didn't have the Thomas Guide or, or the AAA map. He just had God saying, go, and he went, and God blessed him and became who, who you and I know is the father of many nations. Why? Because he believed, first and foremost, that God is God. And secondly, he believed that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And he followed what God said, and God rewarded Abraham. If we want to live life to the potential that God has, we have got to challenge ourselves to get out from our comfort zones to go beyond what we think, to go beyond what we think we're capable of and saying, you know what? I may be only capable of this, but God, in his power in my life, I'm capable of more. And I'm gonna do more. I'm gonna become more than I thought I ever could. Why? Because that's God's plan for our lives. The essence of all of this talk tonight is that you and I have got to remove the limits of our lives. We've got to learn to remove the limits of our lives. You see, we should never say, we should never say, you know, well, I prayed. Sometimes people come to me, Pastor Luke, I, I, I'm going through this issue. I, I, I need some guidance. I need some. And, well, have you, have you prayed? Yeah, well, I prayed yesterday about it. Well, you, you need to have some faith. Well, I believed, but, well, ha, have you told anybody about it? Well, you know, I shared a, a while back. I told so-and-so about it a couple weeks ago. You've got to understand that. 
Yesterday's prayer was for yesterday. You can't live in yesterday. Jesus says anybody who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy for the kingdom of God. Paul the apostle says, I count it all as trash, as garbage, but I move forward. He was talking about all the benefits of his life, all the things that he had to brag about. You see, you cannot look and lean on the prayers of yesterday. God says, I want prayers for today. You can't lean on, well, I shared yesterday with someone. How about sharing today? I cared for somebody. I, 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 I did my penance. It's not about penance. God says, I want you to love what I love and hate what I hate. How about loving people every day? Well, I believed, but, well, what stopped you? As Paul tells you, the Galatian church, who hindered your faith? Who stopped your progress? Yesterday's faith was yesterday's faith. Today is a new day. And you've got to lean today. And then tomorrow is a new day. And you've got to lean on faith tomorrow. You've got to go before the Lord in prayer. You've got to share your testimony. You've got to care. You've got to wear the goodness of God. Each and every day, we've got to apply these principles in our life to, to live the, 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 the limitless possibilities that God has for each and every one of us. So today, the things that we talked about and what it's going to take to, to live a full, our lives to the full potential. It's going to take prayer, the effective, fervent prayers of the righteous. It's going to take uh, uh, paying attention to listening to God and to letting God speak into our lives, not just us speaking to God. It's going to take for you and I to share our testimonies, to let somebody else know, to sharpen the iron around you so that somebody would sharpen you. To care for those around us, to love what God loves, to hate what God hates. To wear the goodness of God. We are walking billboards of God's goodness and His glory in our lives. And to dare to step out in faith and to get out of our comfort zone and see what God would have and to live that life of limitless potentials. Did you guys get something out of that word today? <laughs> Praise God. Hey, listen, before we leave tonight, I want to give you just a quick opportunity. As ushers are finishing up their job, and please, nobody leave, nobody walk out. No, just give me a moment more. I, fin I promise we'll be done in just a few minutes. I want to ask you a very important question. You'd be ashamed for us to talk about God's potential for your life and what God's plan is for your life and, and let you walk out of this place under false pretenses. The last thing, the worst thing we could ever do is allow you to live under false pretenses. So let me share with you a question and, and challenge you. To, to examine your heart, to examine your life. If you were to leave and your heart were to stop beating and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Simple question. You say, man, I, I, you know, Pastor Luke, I, I think I'd get to heaven. Pastor Luke, I want to get to heaven. I'd go, I'd go to heaven. Let me ask you this. What makes you so sure you're going to get to heaven? You, you, you might say, you know, Pastor Luke, I think so. I want so. I want to. I hope so. You know, I, I always just thought that, you know, that, that's how you get there. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God can you find that because you think you want to get to heaven, because you want to go to heaven, because you hope that you're going to find your way into heaven, that, it, that it, by chance you get there, that you're going to get to heaven? You can't get to heaven based on your thoughts, based on your hopes, based on your desires. There's more to it than that. Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say you can get to heaven because your parents told you you're going to go to heaven? Well, my parents told me I was a Christian when I was, when I was a child growing up. I've always just called myself a Christian. Did you know you, because you've given yourself a title doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven? You know, that's like me calling myself a Dodger and going and trying to sit in the dugout of the Dodger Stadium. At no point am I really a member of the organization. They're going to kick me out. They're going to kick me out of that place, probably lock me up for trying to break into that place. Just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Doesn't mean that you're going to get into heaven. Just because your parents told you as a child you're going to get into heaven, hey, that's not a guarantee. There's only one way. There's only one guarantee. We'll talk about that in just a moment. You say, well, you know, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. I've always thought that, you know, as long as I never robbed the 7-Eleven, as long as I didn't do too much bad and I did more good in my life than I did bad, then I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you ever find that because you're good, because you have good deeds, because you give to the Red Cross or charitable organizations, that you're going to go to heaven? The Bible tells us that our good deeds according to God are like filthy rags. You see, God's standard for, for heaven is perfection. And the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You see, you and I will never be good enough to get into heaven. It's not about how good we are in our lives. It's not about what our parents tell us. It's not about whether or not you're here today. Well, Pastor Luke, I sit in church. People who go to church go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you go to church, you get to heaven? That because you sit in a chair, because you hear a man talk, because you sing some songs and clap your hands, because you drop a, a dollar bill in a bucket as it goes by. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you're going to get to heaven for those things? You can't get there. I love you enough, I respect you enough, I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven based on your own devices because you volunteered in the children's or the youth ministry of your, your last church or sang in the choir. You can't get to heaven based on your own ways. You see, God's standard for heaven is perfection. It's God's heaven. The only way to get into God's heaven is God's way, and, and He demands perfection. But the problem is, is we have sin in our lives. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So therefore, we all 
ineligible to get into heaven. The only way we can get there is through Jesus Christ. And Jesus says this in the book of John. He says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. So let's not try to get to God's heaven any other way but God's way, and that's through Jesus. Jesus, as he was having a discussion in the book of John, you can read it for yourself, John the third chapter. Jesus is discussing with a, with a, a, a really good guy, a man by the name of Nicodemus. They're talking about the subject of eternal life. And let me tell you about Nicodemus. Nicodemus, the Bible tells us he was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. This means that this was an educated man. He knew the scripture. He did all the right things. He said all the right things. He gave to the poor. He, 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 he was a good person. And you would have thought that as they were discussing heaven, that Jesus would have pat Nicodemus on the back and said, man, you just keep on going, doing what you're doing. You're headed in the right way. But Jesus says to Nicodemus these words. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does that mean? You're, you're thinking born again. You're thinking, oh man, you're talking about that, that Jesus freak, that weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. I, I, listen, man, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Listen, I don't care what Hollywood, I don't care what society has made out the, the term born again to be. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the eyes of God, it's always meant the same thing. Hollywood has no concept of God. But God, in his heart, born again, has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me show you in the Bible. The Bible tells us in the book of James that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because it's not about your mental ascent of who God is. Listen, I already know you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here today. It's not about how much you know about Jesus. It's not about the fact that you can memorize Scripture. It's about giving God all of your heart. It's about giving God all of your life. In the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to the church. The words of Christ and ready. He's speaking to you and I. And he says, listen, I'm coming back, he says. And when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Jesus goes on and he says, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, a shocking statement. What is Jesus saying? He's saying that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does it mean to be lukewarm? What does it mean to be, you know, lukewarm in my relationship? I don't understand that. Let me explain it to you. Lukewarm is simply a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down. It's like warm water. It's not hot. It's not cold. It's right in the middle. And Jesus says that that's you riding the fence, riding in the middle. A little bit of the world, a little bit of God. Not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. He says, if that's you, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into heaven. And listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough to not try to pull the wool, wool over your eyes or let you live a life under false pretenses, but to tell you the truth, that the only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that's to give Him all of our heart, to give Him all of our life. So all across this auditorium, I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment. Jesus said these words also. He said that if you confess Him before men, He'll confess you before His Father. But if you deny Him before men, He'll deny you before His Father. So I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment. Here's what I'm going to do. Just a moment, I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, I'm going to go one, two. On the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud, just like that. And I'm going to go bang. Here's what I want you to do. I want to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. What, I'm, what you're doing by the raising your hand, you're saying, hey, Pastor Luke, I, I, want, I want to get saved today. Pastor Luke, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to make sure today that I get into heaven. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put your hand right back down. I won't embarrass you. You see, God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. And he's not going to, he's not, listen, you guys got to get a right, we got to get a right understanding of God. He's not this kid on an anthill burning you up with a glass. He's not standing there in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head because of all the decisions you've made. You see, God loved you enough to give Jesus Christ a beaten, bloody mess, to die on the cross naked, a spectacle for your and my sin and shame so that we could give him all of our heart and give him all of our life. So you say, man, I might be embarrassed if I raise my hand. You might be. But if God can give his everything for you, in return, he wants yours. And it starts by making that profession. It starts by making that stand. So today, wherever you're at, don't let that moment of embarrassment stop you if that's the case. We're not going to embarrass you, so get over it. This is more important than that. And God's desire, God's plan is for you today. So who should raise their hand if you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life? Today, if that's you, just a moment, pop your hand up. If you're not sure, maybe you did this at a harvest or a Billy Graham crusade a long time ago, but you never really followed through with it. Maybe you did this in the youth group and when you were a child, but you never really, you really, never really carried it out. If that's you today, listen, don't walk out of this place without making sure that's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. You don't know what tomorrow holds. Who should raise your hand? Maybe you've been running from God instead of to God, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You've been living lukewarm. Listen, it's time to get one foot out of the world, one foot, one foot out of the door, one foot into the door. It's time to get all the way in for God. He wants you to jump head first into this. Today, this is the day for you to get hot in your relationship and make sure that you're headed to heaven, leaving hell behind. Listen, whether you believe it, whether you see it, whether you can feel it or not, it's irrelevant. 
You say, man, Pastor, look, I, I, I don't know about heaven or hell. Even I, I can't make that decision. I, I've never seen it. You know full well right now that there are radio waves going from me to the sound booth because you can hear the sound of my voice, but you can't see them, you can't feel them, but you know they exist. Come on, let's get over that, that, that low thinking. And let's, let's understand that there are things in this world that we can't see, that we can't feel, but we know that they are very real. Heaven is a real place, real enough for God to tell us about it. Jesus to teach, about, teach us about it. It's time for us to take serious. Let's stop playing games with God. This is your moment. This is your day. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. This is your divine appointment. You are here for a reason. God has a plan. God's desire is a limitless life to go above and beyond your expectations. But it starts by making a stand for God. And today is your day. Today is your opportunity. I'm going to count from the front to the back, wherever you're at. If that's you, in just a moment, pop your hands up. If you're in the family rooms, you guys back there in the family rooms, I'll see it. Pop your hand up. And I'll see it, all right? I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. If that's you all across this place, wherever you're at, this is your moment. This is your time. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I see those hands over there. Ten wise people. Anybody else in this place today? I see you guys. I saw you guys back over there. Anybody else in this place today? Ten wise people. Anybody else? You say, eleven. I see that right there. Eleven. I see that hand. Anybody else in this place? Say, man, I, want to, I wonder if I should. You should. You should. Come on, anybody else in this place today? 11 wise people. 11 wise people. Anybody else? I'm going to close it down right now. Well, hey, praise God for 11 wise people. Right on. Woo! Hey, here's what we do. All right, you raise your hand. You say, man, I want to do this now. It's time to follow through. And here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, Elijah's going to sing a song. And as he does, we're all going to stand as we stand. For those of you that raised your hand or those of you that should have raised your hand, but maybe you didn't. Maybe you were too afraid. Maybe you couldn't do that. Listen, it's not too late. As we all stand in just a moment, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. Maybe you came with somebody, a friend. If you need a friend, grab them. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me in the aisle. We're going to pray together. We're going to change destinies. You're going to get born again right here, right now. This is your moment. This is your time. So listen, nobody leaving this time, but let's all stand together. If you raise your hand, come on, get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come meet me here. Let's change destinies right now. You're on my line. You're on my Come on, you can come. Today is a new day. Listen, first of all, I gotta tell you something. All right, you gotta wipe those frowns upside down. Okay, you're not going to a funeral, going to a birthday celebration. You're gonna be born again. Today is your birthday, all right? You're gonna receive Jesus Christ in just a moment. Hey, man, I gotta tell you, little man, you are looking good. Give me your knuckles, dude. Right on, brother. Right, oh, yeah. Right on. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you guys right over there. Listen, nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets. Oh, you made it through me. It's all down here for me. It's easy stuff, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by praying and making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, okay? So he's going to lead you in a prayer. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. Real easy readings, just a little bit of literature. As you walk out of this place, you say, man, what do I do? Where do I go now? We're going to point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to offer you a friend. We give away friends here at the church. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. They, they teach you how to use that gym equipment because so, you have no clue how to use it and make sure you're being effective. Uh, a spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody will meet with you before church for five weeks. They give you a really neat Bible at the end of that process. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things about the Word of God to get you strong in your walk with God so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent him for me, and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.